Thank you for listening to Life Improvement Radio. You are listening to a rebroadcast of a previously recorded show. We're live at the Mind Book Fair, powered by Life Improvement Radio. You can go ahead and go to lifeimprovementradio.com for more information. Also, neilhaley.com, all those different places. I'm with my co-host, Peter Alvich and Eric Remmel, as we are continuing the marathon of interviews, meaning we got to about 2 o'clock today. A lot of exciting guests, and I'm really excited to welcome the program is Elizabeth Rosner, author of Survivor Cafe, The Legacy and Trauma of the Labyrinth of Memory. Elizabeth, thanks for calling. Thanks for having me. Now, let's get to this. I remember Electric City. I remember our interview last year with Electric City and, and how it was a very, very interesting uh, view of a specific town in New York, if I remember correctly, mm-hmm. and how That's that right. whole story went through. Is there any similarities with your new book to the life Well, you know, that was a historical novel and it right. required a tremendous amount of research, which was new for me as a novelist. My previous two books had been contemporary novels that, that didn't take me into a lot of research territory. But now that I look back at Electric City, a lot of what I learned from that book was how to do research. And that served me extremely well in the writing of Survivor Cafe. I was blending a very personal narrative in this book with a lot of investigation into how my own experience of inherited trauma connects me with other cultures, other generations, other experiences of the aftermath of atrocity and war and genocide. Yes, uh... And that's the, the, the word genocide is, 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 is really something that's going to build a big aftermath, right, of what happens to a community after that. Well, and I'm very interested in, in the aftermath both on the individual level and on the collective level. So genocide can often sound like a really big term, and it is a big term. We're talking about mass murder, loss of life on the scale of, as in the case of the Holocaust, millions of people. But at the same time, I think it's really important for us to remember it as a personal, individual experience. We have to keep humanizing the victims. Otherwise, we really become lost in a kind of abstraction about war and abstraction about mass atrocity that really is part of the reason that we keep repeating ourselves as human beings. We repeat often our worst behaviors. A lot of what I talk about in this book is trying to come back to an intimate story of loss and suffering and how those things then reverberate through generations, not just the people who suffered trauma, but their subsequent offspring, grandchildren, and so on. Wow. Yeah. Um, with, With, like, creating the book, um, kind of like what are the thoughts going through your brain when you're kind of creating and molding and doing research and kind of trying to create that uh, human aspect of it so it's not so much of a of a event but more of a uh, personal connection to your readers? Well, the reason that I start with my, my own personal experience, both of my parents survived the Holocaust. And so I grew up with this legacy in my own psyche, in my own body, in my own awareness. So that really helps me stay connected to the individual level experience when I read about and study what it's like to grow up in the shadow of the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki when that happened to your parents or your grandparents. What happens if you are the generation that comes after the Vietnam War and your father was a veteran of that war? What happens if you're a Cambodian refugee and the majority of your family was murdered by the Khmer Rouge? So people can go to history books to read sort of the big story, the overarching story of those horrors. But in my case, using my myself as an example, I'm really looking at the traces and the residue that impact us as human beings one at a time. And some of the research that's coming forward now is there's a, there's a relatively new field of science called epigenetics. A lot of people are hearing that term that may not quite understand what it means. And, and I should say, I'm not a scientist myself, but I've been studying this a great deal. And they're beginning to find that 
people who suffer trauma have some sort of genetic modification that's occurring. It's not the gene itself, but it's a kind of an on-off switch that's attached to a gene. And when that change takes place, that starts then showing up in their children, their grandchildren, to the point where grandchildren of people who went through trauma are showing signs of PTSD from a trauma they never directly experienced. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, so, so is that really, that, that is really true, Elizabeth. That's shocking to know. So that there are going to be soldiers, children, that are going to deal with PTSD just because of the experience a certain soldier had. That's what they're saying. And it's not like you're doomed to experience it. It means you might have a tendency in that direction. It means you might be sort of oh predisposed gosh. to have that experience. But at the same time, you know, we inherit all sorts of things, right? So we inherit resilience, we inherit optimism, we inherit perseverance. I feel like I got all of those qualities from my parents in addition to their sorrow, their anxiety, their um, their deep sense of loss. I feel like, you know, it's a mixed bag, right? That's what That's what the genetics, you know, offer all of us really is this sort of unpredictable mix of things. But the other thing I've noticed is that the more we pay attention to those things, the more we're able to name those things, the more empathy and compassion we can have for each other. So for teachers, for instance, who are working with young kids who some of these kids seem to have, you know, major behavior issues and they can't really understand what's going on with this kid. Nothing bad has happened to this kid, but this kid is acting out in strange ways they start to look back through the family legacy and they see that maybe two or three generations back there was a major trauma in the family. And they can start to see this as an opportunity to work with the child in a more proactive way, to be protective and careful and gentle and responsive in ways that relate to this history of trauma in the family. Wow. You know, yeah. I was, I was thinking if, like, if uh, a person of your family, and then you're like, you know, say two or three generations different uh, from the person who had the traumatic event, do you think that at times, uh, if if they did, you know, they know about the event, but if they're like, you know, let's say like going to school and being educated on the event, like let's say like a class, you have a movie or you have audio or you have a teacher talking. Do you think someone, uh, do you think there's cases where people not only experience kind of like, you know, it's a back of the brain kind of emotional response to it, but uh, do you think there's ever like a um, a visual component that would ever arise from, you know, mm -hmm. these type of mm -hmm. things? So like I if do. the person yeah. was reliving the event themselves? Yeah, and that, you know, I remember experiencing those kinds of things when I was a kid in school where somebody in a classroom would show a film of something and I would be looking for my parents' faces in the film because I had heard mm -hmm. those stories told not as a historic event but as a family history, right? So pictures of concentration camp survivors that were taken by the liberating army of America who came and discovered these horrific sites. You know, I'm looking at these emaciated faces and I'm trying to see, does any of them look like my father who would have been 16 at the time? Could that be him? Yeah. Could that be him? And, you know, what's really amazing is that we're starting to discover that this is happening to people who didn't even hear the stories. They don't yeah. even know what happened, but they're still having those responses. <sighs> yeah, it's intense. And, you know, you asked me what was it like for me doing the research, and I, I have to tell you that there were times I really had to take breaks from what I was studying because it was so upsetting and heartbreaking. And yet, honestly, my motivation for writing this book um, was really urgent because we're at a pivotal moment right now historically where the first-hand witnesses of World War II are aging and passing away. So that includes not just the Holocaust survivors, but the liberating soldiers. It includes the perpetrators in Europe. It includes the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and Pearl Harbor. And then, you know, you, you continue that onward, the survivors of the massacres and genocides in Rwanda, the survivors of the, the killing fields in, in Cambodia, 
all of these 20th century atrocities are going to start receding into history more and more. What do we need to do to keep the stories alive in a way that, that really stays personal and close and intimate? So that's a lot of my motive for writing this book right now and having these conversations right now. Huh. Yeah. yeah. You know, I was thinking, too, is for, um, you know, being kind of down the line from someone who's had a traumatic experience, do you think that it makes most people stronger after kind of experiencing and talking about those events with the older generation or learning about the uh, older generation? Or do you think it more so kind of breaks them down and they kind of have to get back up, so to speak, by themselves? You know, it's a great question, and I think there's a whole spectrum of answers to that because on the one hand, when we look at this from a scientific point of view, we think, well, there must be a benefit to us as a species for these kinds of memories to be passed on, for these kinds of traumatic residues to be passed on. So what could be the advantage of that? Does it make us more sensitive and hyper-vigilant about potential harm and helps us avoid harmful situations? Does it help strengthen us, as you said, and make us more resilient and more um, more able to to persevere against the odds, even when things have been difficult, we kind of pick ourselves back up and move on. You know, when I think of my my father, who thankfully is still alive, he is such a great example of somebody who, no matter how many difficult things have happened to him in his life, he's incredibly optimistic and he's incredibly forward-moving. He takes each day as it comes. And when I remember asking him when I was a teenager asking him how, as a teenager himself, so I was his age when I was asking him this, I was 15 to 16, and he was 15 to 16 in the concentration camp. I said, how did you do it? How did you get through every single day of that nightmare? And he said to me, each day was so horrible that I had to believe that things had to be better the next day. Mm Mm-hmm. And if that isn't the definition of optimism, I don't know what is. You know, so he has served yeah. as that kind of role model for me throughout my life. And I have to admit, I'm not really nearly as optimistic as my father, but somehow he reminds me of that every single day by his example. And the, you know, the other thing about this is we're still just beginning to understand how this works. And We don't know how many generations these effects last, but if you look around right now, you look at all of the the racism and the misogyny and the anti-immigrant sentiments and all of these ways that our society is full of, you know, rage and fear, you know, it, it seems that this is more than just a contemporary issue, right? This is a legacy of our shared history. We haven't fully resolved the traumas left behind by slavery, left behind by the Civil War. Clearly, we're still looking at the evidence of that, the harm that has been transmitted on and on and on. So I think what we're really looking at is how can we help understand ourselves better so that we heal from that, so that we help each other heal from that. Well, fantastic. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Uh, Elizabeth, where's the best place we can find information on you and purchase your book? Where can we go? Well, I have a website, um, elizabethrosner.com, that has all sorts of information about me and my book and my previous work and my family history and, you know, interviews with me and reviews of the book. The title, again, is Survivor Cafe, The Legacy of Trauma and the Labyrinth of Memory. All right. Well, thanks for calling, Elizabeth. Best of luck, and thanks for coming on the show. Thanks so much for having me. It's been a pleasure talking to you today. Take care. Thanks. Appreciate it. Bye. Bye-bye. You listen to Neil Haley's show, Powered by Life Improvement Radio, live from the My Book Fair. We'll be back in just a moment. Thank you for listening to Life Improvement Radio. The views expressed by show hosts or their guests are their own and shall not be construed in any way as advice from Life Improvement Radio. We make no recommendations or endorsements for radio show programs, services, or products mentioned on air or on our website. Personal perspectives expressed by the producers, writers, or editors will always be presented as such. Any rebroadcast or retransmission without the expressed written consent of Life Improvement Radio is strictly prohibited. Thanks for listening.